Prime Minister's advisor on rough sleeping. As Community Secretary, I'll be updating you on our support for the most vulnerable people in society. I'll be updating you on how we are shielding people from coronavirus in England and the next steps for our programme of support for rough sleepers during the pandemic. But first, I want to update you on the latest data on the coronavirus response. 4,285,738 tests for coronavirus have now been carried out in the United Kingdom, including 115,725 tests carried out yesterday. 274,762 people have tested positive. That's an increase of 1,936 cases since yesterday. 7,639 people are currently in hospital with coronavirus, down 15% from 8,945 this time last week. And sadly, of those tested positive for coronavirus across all the settings, 38,489 have now died. That's an increase of 113 fatalities since yesterday. Behind each of those deaths is a mourning family and heartbroken friends and loved ones. Our thoughts and prayers, as ever, are with all of them. At the start of this pandemic, we advised clinically extremely vulnerable people to shield until the 30th of June. These are individuals who are most at risk of severe illness if they contract the virus. So protecting them has been especially important during the pandemic. I think it's important to explain who is shielding. They are not exclusively older people. Over half are under 70. Over 90,000 of them are actually children. And they sadly will not be able to return to school tomorrow if their year group is. And hundreds of thousands of those shielding are or were at work before the pandemic. Many of these people are working from home, but where this is not possible, they're unable to do the jobs that I'm sure they would wish to be doing. The one thing they all have in common is that they've made a huge sacrifice. I'd like to echo the Prime Minister in recognising the resilience of people shielding across the country and express our admiration for their ongoing efforts. We know that they often live with other people, so this has had a profound impact on their lives as well. And family members have, have often had to sacrifice a lot to protect the people that they love the most. And I know that a significant number of those shielding haven't left the house at all for nine or 10 weeks. That is quite an extraordinary restriction on their lives. For those who were advised to shield, we set up the National Shielding Service, a huge logistical exercise unprecedented since the Second World War. This has included delivering over two and a half million free food boxes, securing priority supermarket delivery services, ensuring people can get medicines delivered to their doorstep, and working closely in partnership with local government and our fantastic NHS volunteer responders, helping people in a myriad of other ways, be that delivering shopping, calling people for a check-in and chat, or providing essential care. Over 350,000 people who are shielding have registered for some form of support from the government, like food, like medicine deliveries. But more than half of those shielding have also said to us that they want somebody to talk to over the phone. So none of us should forget the emotional burden, isolation, 
places upon people and the effects on mental health and general well-being. For anyone, shielding or not, it's important that you seek the help that you need and it is available despite the restrictions. So please, if this is you, go to gov.uk or the Every Mind Matters website for advice and practical steps as to what you can do and the support that's available for your well-being during this time. I'm immensely grateful to all of those in the NHS who have and continue to go above and beyond to support those most at risk during the virus. We also recognise the role of local councils and parish councils who supported their residents with great effect. When we announced a gradual relaxation of restrictions in the last week, I know that many people who are shielding will have been asking, what about me? Today, we're setting out the next steps for the shielded. Now that we've passed the peak and the prevalence of COVID-19 in the community has reduced significantly, we believe that the risk to those shielding is lower, as it is proportionately for the general population. As with the guidance for shielded people more generally, we want to give people the information and the advice that they need to make the best decisions for them. This is, as always, advisory for the shielded. So as a first step, I can announce today that we have updated the shielded guidance so that from tomorrow, Monday the 1st of June, people will be advised that they can take initial steps to safely spend time outdoors. This guidance is for England only, but we're working very closely with the devolved administrations in Scotland, in Wales and Northern Ireland, who will issue their own guidance in due course. Those shielding will be able to spend outdoors with members of their own household, or if they live alone, with one person from another household. This reflects a lower risk of transmission outdoors, as well as the significantly reduced prevalence of COVID-19 in the community. The full guidance will be uploaded to gov.uk later today. You must still follow social distancing guidelines and remain at a two metre distance from others. This will enable those shielding to see loved ones like children and grandchildren, something many I know are aching to do. Having spent many weeks indoors, some will understandably be very cautious and concerned about going outdoors. You should only do what you are comfortable with. In our roadmap, we've set out, while the shielding guidance is currently in place until the end of June, it may need to be extended beyond that point. Our guidance to those who are shielding will always be advisory, but it's critical that it's based on the most up-to-date evidence and data. So today I can say that as part of each review for the social distancing measures for the wider population, we will also review the risks for the clinically extremely vulnerable and assess whether we as we currently believe the shielding period needs to be extended and whether it is possible for the shielding guidance to be eased further. We will base each assessment on clinical advice from our medical experts and the best data available about the prevalence of COVID-19 within the community. The next review of shielding measures will take place in the week commencing the 15th of June, and we'll consider the next steps for the programme more generally beyond the 30th of June. Following that review, the NHS will also write to all individuals on the shielding patient list with information about next steps on shielding advice and the support that will be available to them. If the conditions become less favourable, our advice to those being asked to shield will unfortunately need to be tightened. The government will continue to ensure that support is available to those who need it for as long as possible and for as long as people are advised to follow the shielding guidance. Once again, 
can I thank all those shielding for your patience and for your fortitude. Everybody across the country appreciates the unique challenges that you face. And we want to continue to do all we can to ensure that whilst you might be at home shielding for a bit longer, you are not alone. Secondly, I want to provide an update on our work on rough sleeping. And I'm joined, as I said earlier, by the Prime Minister's advisor on rough sleeping, Dame Louise Casey. From the start of this pandemic, we believed we had a special duty to protect the most vulnerable in our society. And this was especially necessary for those people sleeping rough on our streets. Working hand in hand with charities and local councils, we've offered accommodation to over 90% of rough sleepers known to us at the start in order to help them to stay safe during the pandemic. I want to thank everyone who's been involved in this huge national effort. Thousands of lives have been protected because of your work. We've ensured councils in England have the funding to help continue housing rough sleepers in emergency accommodation as part of the £3.8 billion we've provided to them in the last two months. And we will continue to fund this essential work to get the job done. But as we enter the next phase in our battle against coronavirus, it's right that we start to look ahead. Our goal has always been that as few people as possible return to the streets. But words and promises are not enough because of the action that we've already taken for the first time in my lifetime. We know who the vast majority of rough sleepers are and where they're living. That means that we can assess each individual's needs and tailor the support that we provide next. Some people will need help to return to the private rental sector, but others will need accommodation to be provided so that they can start to rebuild their lives. That's why 6,000 new supported homes will be made available for rough sleepers, providing safe accommodation for people we've helped off the streets during the pandemic. The government is backing this effort with £433 million to fast track the safe accommodation desperately needed to ensure as few rough sleepers as possible return to the streets. 3,300 of these new homes will become available in the next 12 months and £160 million will be spent this year to deliver that. But rough sleeping is as much a health issue as it is a housing issue. It's a crisis of addiction and mental health as well. So we will provide specialist support staff for rough sleepers in this new accommodation to ensure that they can continue to receive the health support that they will need to transform their lives and fulfill their potential. These homes will be a springboard to better things and they will serve as a new national asset and be a symbol of hope and our belief that no one's path is predetermined. I'm now going to pass over to Dame Louise Casey. Louise. Thank you, Secretary of State. Firstly, can I add my own condolences to the families and friends of all those who have sadly passed away due to COVID-19. At the outset of this awful crisis, it became clear that what we needed to do was do all we can to make sure we were protecting some of the most vulnerable people in our society. And we must continue to do so. The pandemic is not over. For homeless people, the task was to bring as many people in off the streets and out of communal shelters. The goal was to protect rough sleepers from the virus, give them the chance to self-isolate and ultimately, therefore, to do the best we can to save their lives. There was an absolutely extraordinary response across the public sector, charities and businesses in response to my call to get everyone in. Those efforts have resulted in close to 15,000 people across England now being helped. I'd like to take this opportunity alongside the Secretary of State to thank everyone involved. It was an extraordinary and unusual endeavour. 
from the dedicated outreach workers, the hard-working council staff, to hotels that have opened their doors, and the faith and community groups who have provided friendship and food. It's been an heartening example of what we can do when we need to do it, and the best of Britain in this time of crisis. And by bringing almost everyone in, we now have another extraordinary and unusual endeavour ahead to try and change their lives for good beyond the immediate response to COVID-19. I stand ready to work with all partners and esteemed colleagues in Wales, in Scotland and in Northern Ireland. So I'm really pleased that the government is investing in these 6,000 new homes along with the extra support and money for the costs of their support, meaning that we can help the most vulnerable rough sleepers in the long term. This is a really good start. I am grateful to the Secretary of State and the Prime Minister for their support. But none of us should underestimate the challenge ahead in order to keep everyone in. There is much more that we need to do, but for now I'd just like to thank those in local government, the health service, the civil servants and the countless charities, community groups who've helped protect this, one of our most vulnerable groups in our society during this pandemic. And those such as the Prince's Trust, Business in the Community, Comic Relief, the Anglican and the Catholic churches who have pledged wider support. So now that so many are inside, I hope that we can keep it that way. What has been done here is a small but incredible silver lining in the dark cloud that is COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. I'm now going to hand over to Dr Jenny Harris. Jenny. Thank you. Can I have the first slide, please? Uh, so I'm just going to update on some of the indicators in the progress uh, we are having with managing the pandemic, um, carefully and slowly uh, returning to normal. So the first slide that we see here is social distancing uh, information. It's looking at transport use from uh, Department of Transport data. Um, and on the top row, you can see our car, light commercial and heavy goods vehicle use. Uh, and that is uh, all of this data is laid back to a period uh, of comparison, either earlier in the year or for rail, it goes back to the previous year. And we can see that our car use is gradually picking up uh, as we come out of some of the east, some of the lockdown measures and people are travelling a little further. Uh, important to remind uh, people that we should only be travelling in cars with our own household members. Uh, it's difficult to distance, so this is a potential route of transmission. So uh, hopefully this car use is uh, just for ourselves and our own household members. We can also see like commercial vehicle use gradually picking up as people start returning to work. Uh, and the heavy goods vehicle use has, of course, been uh, much higher through this as all those key workers uh, continue to help us manage through the pandemic delivering uh, essential goods. Um, nevertheless, at the background of this, our national rail, our uh, transport and uh, the bus services have remained very, very low use in comparison to the comparator periods. Um, and this reflects ongoing general use by uh, key workers only. And again, really important as we start coming out of lockdown, uh, that we're using transports carefully and safely. Uh, try and increase uh, use of walking and cycling. Uh, and if you're going uh, traveling by vehicle, private car with your own household remains the safest. Next slide, please. Uh, so this gives uh, an update, as the uh, Secretary of State has said, on uh, how many tests and confirmed cases we've had. So on the top uh, pink slide, uh, you can see that we have performed 4,285,738 tests in total, um, and in the 24 hours up to this morning, 115,725. So these will be tests which have been done in the labs, uh, have been sent out to individuals at home, uh, or have been taken at the satellite units. Um, and we have testing capacity now right up to 200,000. So we have lots of available use there as we move into this next critical phase of using our um, uh, test and track system uh, to try and help support coming out of the pandemic. Uh, there is variation and um, you can see that generally overall the trend remains 
upwards, and we will be encouraging that as we try and uh, squash the disease wherever it might appear. Uh, the bottom, the green chart, shows the new confirmed cases. So these are all cases which have been confirmed in the laboratory. So 274,762 uh, to date in total, and just under 2,000 confirmed in the last 24 hours. That won't reflect the totality because, uh, as many of you watching will know, uh, you may have had symptoms and not had to test at the time. But nevertheless, again, the rolling average, the blue line, uh, shows that the number of cases overall is coming down, and that is despite uh, increased availability and use of testing. Next slide, please. Uh, this shows our data from hospitals. So if we think back to uh, the early weeks of, or the last end of March, early April, um, with considerable concern about the uh, use in our hospitals, the social distancing measures that people watching have undertaken have ensured that the number of people entering hospital has at all times been within the cap capacity of the NHS. And we can see here now that just 545 uh, patients were estimated admissions with COVID-19 on the 29th of May, uh, and that's down by over 100 and, uh, 140 uh, from the previous week, that's for England. And then if we look at data right across the UK for the use of um, ventilator beds, this is now under 10%. Uh, trending downwards in every country, which is really good news. Um, and just to highlight that you can see there that we have never really breached uh, the, the limits of that capacity, which has been really successful. Next slide, please. So now we're looking across the country uh, at the number of people in hospital with COVID-19. Um, and what we can see this week, we're down about 15%. Uh, so 7,639 people down from 8,945. And although the shapes of the uh, epidemic in, in England in the different regions and different countries of the UK are slightly different, with a big peak you can see on the, the blue line at the bottom right for London, nevertheless, they are all continuing to trend downwards. Uh, there have been a few changes in the way data is reported, uh, firstly in Northern Ireland and then in Wales, and that one is particularly marked to explain the variation uh, in, the, in the pattern. Uh, but in reality, all cases are starting to fall, continue to fall, but it is still a very gentle slope downwards. So it is really important that we retain attention, even when we're giving more, being given more freedoms, uh, that we minimise the number of interactions we have and really rigorously stick to social distancing measures. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally, uh, but sadly, we always look at the number of uh, COVID-19 deaths confirmed. So these are people who have sadly died with a positive test. Um, these are cases uh, accumulated from uh, different sources, but um, the number in the last 24 hours is 113. And whilst each of those clearly is a sad death, it is nevertheless significantly uh, better uh, in, in terms of those affected and their families than we were much uh, further back uh, uh, in April, where you can see the peak. Again, there's variation in reporting. Uh, the numbers are still coming down, and you can see the seven-day rolling average, which is a better indicator, really, of the movement generally. It is still going very gently and very uh, slowly at the end so once again uh, as we move forward with the easing in our lockdown uh, just to encourage people to ensure that that doesn't tick back up again and we retain uh, all focus on maintaining social distancing thank you thank you jenny uh, well we'll now come to uh, two questions from members of the public and the first is from john from gloucester If I receive a call from someone who says they are from the test and trace team telling me to self-isolate, how can I confirm that the call is genuine and not from someone acting from ulterior motives? Jenny, do you want to answer how the track and trace system will work in yes. that case? Yes. So, so the track and trace system is actually a very long-standing uh, method, if you like, of finding people and following them through from a case of infectious disease. And 
Public Health England and public health colleagues all across the world do this on a routine basis. Uh, they will start from a piece of information, um, and at the moment, the, the app is not the main source of our current track and trace system. Uh, what is happening is we have 25,000 uh, tracers, if you like, available, and they will start from a piece of information. Um, and it's highly unlikely, uh, with all the confidentiality around the data systems, uh, that you will be contacted uh, inappropriately uh, by anyone. Now, I, I recognise that uh, many of us will be very cautious, and quite rightly so, about interactions from uh, external uh, organisations, but individuals will make it very clear uh, to you that they are following for a particular reason, and I think it will be very obvious in the conversation that you have with them uh, that they are uh, genuine in, in that regard. There has been a lot of... Um, input paid to this particular issue we're really keen obviously we want people to follow this it's for all of our benefits um, and I think it will be very evident when somebody rings you these are professionally trained individuals and sitting uh, over if you like the the telephone interviewers uh, and email senders uh, are a group of uh, senior clinical professionals who are overseeing this for your safety excellent thank you the second question is from Ian from Anglesey and Ian says the agriculture industry and adjacent industries have suffered greatly during the lockdown. How does the government propose to support rural communities to transcend the coronavirus crisis? Well, an important question, and the government has set out from the beginning to try to protect as many people's livelihoods and as many businesses as we can. We won't be able to protect every job and every business, but the range of measures that we've brought forward as a government are unprecedented in our history and compare very favourably to those that have been brought forward by other governments in other countries around the world, from the job retention scheme, which is open to all sectors, including the agriculture industry, if you wished to take part in it, the sea bills, the loans that are available, the bounce back loans uh, that are available uh, at 24 hours notice for businesses, of which uh, tens of thousands of smaller businesses uh, have taken advantage of. And we're also working very closely with the agriculture sector, the food and drink industry, because they're playing such a crucial role. And, you know, I want to pay tribute to everybody involved in those industries who've kept us fed uh, during this crisis, the supermarkets who've ensured that food is on the shelves and they've increased capacity very rapidly uh, and made services available for the vulnerable, uh, for example, increasing the uh, number of individuals who can get privileged access uh, to delivery services as well. So the Environment Secretary is working closely with the industry and we'll do whatever further steps we need to ensure the industry is guided through uh, this period. One particular challenge that we're very focused on is ensuring that the industry has the workforce that it will need this summer to get crops in and to, uh, to the market and onto uh, the shelves of the supermarkets. And we've created a number of important schemes there to encourage people who are looking for work to think about working in the agriculture sector and uh, either on a temporary basis or indeed making a career in a very important part of the UK economy. So thank you, Ian, and thank you to everybody uh, in our farming and agriculture sector for the hard work that you're doing. I'm now going to turn to questions from the media, and the first comes from Chris Mason at the BBC. Good afternoon, Chris. Hi, good afternoon to you. I'd like to ask a quick question about shielding in a moment, if I may, but first a question about lockdown to you, Mr. Jenrick, and also to Dr. Harris. We've heard how crucial it is in this uh, next stage that we stick scrupulously to the rules, that this is a very dangerous moment, that this is a sensitive moment. So I wonder how worried you are, having seen the pictures this weekend, uh, where social distancing is difficult or impossible. Well, if I can answer first and then um, ask Jenny's view, it's really important that all of us continue to play our part. The scientists and medical advisors to the government have modelled that the measures that we have already eased and the measures that are going to be eased tomorrow, such as the opening of um, car showrooms, outdoor markets for non-essential goods and enabling us to uh, meet uh, members of our own household, outside of our own household rather, outdoors, that those additional easements together will still in all likelihood keep the rate of infection below one. So we're reasonably confident that the steps that we've taken and will be taking on Monday 
are manageable, but we have to all continue to play our part in that because the rate of infection remains somewhere between 0.7 and 0.9, and the room for manoeuvre is quite limited. We'll obviously keep this under very close uh, scrutiny as we uh, move into this next phase and as we approach the next decision point on the 15th of June and only take further steps if we're confident that we can continue to keep the rate of infection at that manageable level below one. Jenny. Thank you. Um, so I'll probably start with the good news bit, which is uh, we think if you're outdoors, uh, there is very, very low risk of transmission, which is why most of these measures in this early phase where we're going very carefully and slowly, the scientific message is uh, do the outdoor measures first. Um, having said that, um, the vision that you uh, reported of people crowding uh, almost certainly comes with behavioural elements of people cramming into cars, for example, uh, uh, potentially not sticking to the rules of who is in the car, so it should be yourself or your household only, potentially uh, swapping uh, bits of cutlery or, or picnic uh, kit on the beach and, and being very close together um, and I think you have absolutely highlighted as did my uh, Deputy Chief Medical Officer colleague yesterday this is a really really critical time so where we are um, seeing that uh, government is easing measures the public really really need to stick to uh, those messages and it is not just about what it is possible to do it's about what it is sensible to do and what is sensible to do is have as few interactions as possible as you can with other people in all settings. But there is obviously a balance point here between uh, uh, our, our mental health, our physical health, and our social well-being and our, our work environment. But it's still about uh, limit, if you can, easily, what you are doing. Limit the number of interactions. There are plenty of opportunities to go out, get exercise, uh, be out in the sun without being next to other people. So I think it's really important that people just try to uh, use these measures sensibly for their own benefit, but don't risk uh, transmission to other people. Thanks, Jenny. I know, Chris. I know there, Secretary of State, you talk about being reasonably confident, uh, and I wonder if some people might be less than reassured uh, by that. But if I may, I'll ask, as I said, about, about shielding as a, as a second question. Professor Peter Openshaw, one of your advisors on, on the uh, Andrew Marr show this morning, and suggested that some people may have been asked to shield unnecessarily. And so I wonder how soon you might be able to say more uh, about those people who may be able to uh, return to a level of normality rather quicker uh, than the current guidelines suggest. Well, I'll ask Jenny's uh, professional opinion on that, but as you're right to say that the shielded category is over 2 million people, so there's a number of underlying conditions within that, and there's a range uh, of, uh, of risks within that. We do want to move to a more specific approach in time, and so we are, uh, or our, our medical advisors are taking, uh, uh, are producing advice as to how we can uh, give people more specific, tailored advice to their own condition, rather than the blanket approach that we've done so far. Um, but the advice that we have today remains that the shielded should stay at home, but now can take advantage of the small, uh, modest changes that we've announced uh, in effect from tomorrow, the ability to, to meet somebody from outside your household, socially distance, if you've been living alone, or the ability to go out for, for walks with your household, things which I think will be hugely appreciated by those people. Jenny. Thank you. Um, so I think just to reiterate something the Secretary of State said earlier, that this is very much advice to these individuals for them to take measures to protect their own health, and that is the starting point. Um, I recognise sometimes that's been interpreted in different ways and, and we have a very wide range of response to that with some people being very frightened to uh, do anything at all, which is absolutely understandable, uh, to other people who uh, at the end of their life, and we recognise this in writing the original guidance, would like to just prioritise things which are important to them uh, and the risks are, of this disease are not uh, as important you know they want to to do the things that are really important to them so it is very much for individuals but i think uh, one of the problems we've had is uh, it's a hugely complex uh, program 
Um, and just the clinical concept of it uh, was based on uh, sensible uh, best first principles, if you like, around respiratory disease, uh, who would be at risk if you have if your immune system is suppressed, uh, as we encountered a new virus. Now, as we're going forward, we now have much more data on individual diseases, so around cardiovascular disease or liver disease or renal disease. Um, and what we're looking to do ahead is to try and understand that risk better, along with other characteristics, so for example, your age, um, and have uh, some sort of way of translating that, both for an individual, so that they get a sense, a proportionate sense of where their risk is and can make a, a decision uh, in, a, in a more enhanced way, but also for uh, many of the clinical colleagues who have been doing a fabulous job in general practice and in some specialist services in hospitals to try and support their patients so that there's an opportunity to have that discussion. So I think in the short term, we are where we are, and as long as uh, the epidemiology continues to show a decline in cases and a reduction in risk in the community, then we will be looking to uh, hopefully help all people to move from that shielded position as quickly as possible. Um, it is possible, of course, that there could be another wave, particularly as we go into the winter. Um, and so what we're really keen to do is ensure that we have this uh, new approach ready for that, and particularly also if we do get a vaccine in the future so that we can target it, if appropriate, uh, to those people who are most in need. So I think uh, as we go forward, a much more nuanced approach, which I think will be welcome um, and we can explain risk more, but for the time being, I think we are leaving it as it would be very complicated if we're hopefully looking forward to something a, a little bit more uh, relaxed, if you like, over the next couple of months. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. And the next question comes from Paul Brand from ITV. Yeah, thank you both. To the Secretary of State and to the Deputy CMO, We've been hearing from quite a few people who are shielding at the moment who still feel very, very, very um, vulnerable. Given that the number of cases is still higher now than when we first went into lockdown, why should they feel any safer leaving their homes? Well, perhaps I'll ask Jenny to, yeah, to comment shall I first. Start with that? So I, I think um, for the reasons which I've just uh, articulated before about our understanding of individual risks with individual diseases, that is still a learning process. So it can still be quite difficult to give a very uh, individual approach to that risk assessment. It's, it's, it's a new disease. But I think uh, what we're looking at is the whole um, idea, if you like, behind the shielding programme was because the modelling identified uh, a, a significant number of people uh, at risk, mostly in the elderly. And in fact, that is actually still the case, although we have significant numbers shielding uh, who are below that age, but particularly for the elderly, uh, that uh, if we could, if you like, in the nicest possible way, take them out of the peak as it came, uh, that would reduce their exposure to the virus at the time when it was at its highest circulation. And you will have seen from the graphs earlier, that's exactly where we are. We um, uh, promoted the programme at the start of the peak, and now our advice is that we're getting towards the tail end of that. And we can look at the uh, number of cases it is a difference between the number of cases uh, that were confirmed at the time, but the numbers we now know from all sorts of things to do with um, genomics and, and modelling, where that peak started. So I think at the start of this, uh, their expectation, if you'd been out, it would have been about one in 40 of meeting somebody with disease. It's now about one in 400 to 500. Um, and the instance of new cases is about one in a thousand. So nothing will ever be 100% safe. We have to be really clear about that. We can never guarantee that. Uh, but it's a, it's a seismic change, if you like, uh, and it's, we're coming out of that peak. And, and Paul, just to follow up on that, we're not today asking people or advising people to stop shielding. Far, far from it. What we're saying to the people who have been shielding for the last 10 weeks is that we think that the rate of infection is sufficiently low now to enable you to do some quite modest things like going outside for a walk with members of your household or like if you've been living alone um, meeting somebody from another household but those are things which will make a huge difference to the lives of these people as I said earlier in my opening remarks perhaps as much, many as a half of the people who've been shielding haven't left the home in all of that time and so the small changes that we're making which hopefully members of the public, if they choose to do them, will do in a socially distant way. I think we'll have a huge impact on people's mental health and well-being 
while still continuing to ensure that they're protected by being at home and reducing the amount of face-to-face -face contact that they have with people outside their household to the absolute minimum. Do you, want to, offer, do you want a follow-up question, Paul? Yes, please. Just a quick one to the Deputy CMO. Should we be concerned at all that the number of deaths appears to have plateaued over the past sort of five or six days? You know, is progress plateauing perhaps just as we're beginning to lift the lockdown? So to, to answer that, one is if it's genuinely plateauing, yes, we should be very concerned. And that is um, uh, the reason we need to be really, really carefully not only watching the numbers, but actually watching what we are doing. So we have to keep applying the social distancing measures, limit the number of interactions we have, and very carefully and sensibly uh, pick up those easements to make our lives better, uh, but not overdo it. So limit the number of interactions. Having said that, of course, uh, we know from the data that it does rely in part on when uh, cases are reported, so we can all see the blips at the weekend. So I think we need to be watching over a longer period than a few days to get a sense. And that is, of course, why we have the rolling average, because it gives a much more uh, uh, a proportionate picture, if you like, of what is happening in reality. But yes, it, it is a critical time. We, we need to be very careful. Great. Thank you, Paul, very much indeed. And the next question comes from Jane Deeth from Channel 4. Jane. Yes, uh, thank you. Secretary of State, on the uh, easing of lockdown rules in England tomorrow, on the 10th of May, the Prime Minister addressed the nation and said that we would gradually give people more freedoms following a COVID alert level system. And he said, if the alert level won't allow it, we will simply wait until we've got it right. We're currently at level four, which wouldn't allow for a relaxation of social distancing. So if the alert level hasn't changed, what has? Well, thank you very much, Jane. The alert level is changing. We are still at level four, but we're transitioning to level three. And that does enable us to open up very cautiously some aspects of our businesses and our daily lives. And the steps that we're taking are quite modest. They're opening up car showrooms and forecourts, predominantly an outdoor activity. Uh, it's opening up uh, those markets or the stalls on markets which sell non-essential goods. Many of the markets themselves will have been open already but selling food and drink. They'll now be able to sell other products. Again, outdoor where the rate of transmission is lower. And then the important for our well-being uh, measure of enabling people to meet somebody um, from outside of their household. But again, outdoors, socially distant. So the measures that are coming into force on Monday are cautious, modest ones, entirely consistent with the message that the Prime Minister uh, delivered when he addressed the nation previously. Yesterday, your colleague, Jonathan Van Tam, said the rules are there for the benefit of, of, of all and they apply to all. Do you agree? Ab absolutely. Um, so uh, I, I thought his, his exposure of, of what he felt was exactly right. We usually say exactly the same things because we think in public health terms, and I think that's right. And uh, from my own perspective, I can assure you that uh, on a matter of sort of personal and professional integrity, uh, I will always try and follow the rules as I know he does. So yes, I think we all do. But the important thing is there, they are all rules for all of us. And it is really important as we go through into this next critical phase uh, that we do all uh, follow them to the best of our ability and actually even minimise, if you like, some of the freedoms that are there to ensure that we can very gently come out of the pandemic. And if we start to spot things on the data, uh, which is difficult, there's opportunity then for scientific review, uh, advice to government about what things need to be done as we go forward. Thank you very much, um, Jane. Do you want to come, come back with a, a follow-up to either of us, or are you happy with those responses? No, great. Thank you very much indeed. The next question is John Stevens from uh, the Daily Mail. John. Uh, thank you, Secretary of State. Um, I wanted to ask, following your announcement on shielding today, where this leaves people with relatives in care homes, could they soon be allowed to make visits, or could they, for example, see loved ones from a distance outside in a garden or through a window? Um, briefly, I wanted to ask your response to reports today that you gave the green light to a £1 billion housing development just weeks after a Tory party fundraising dinner where you sat at the same table as the developer. Thank you, John. Well, let me answer the, the, uh, the second question first, if I may. Um, 
we want to build more homes in this country. We have a housing crisis. We need to get the country building. That's absolutely at the heart of the mission of this government. And I think when we come out of this pandemic, it will be even more true that we want to see decent, affordable homes in all parts of the country. And that is what I want to do as Housing Secretary. With, in respect to the planning application I think you're referring to, that was judged on the merits. It would actually have allowed hundreds of affordable homes to be provided in one of London's uh, most deprived boroughs, which would have been extremely valuable. There was no bias in that decision, but to ensure complete fairness and no inference of that whatsoever, we offered to redetermine the decision in the usual way, and the other parties to the application all agreed uh, to do that. And so I think that was the right way to move forwards. Jenny, did you want to Shall answer Shall I the comment on the, on the care homes one? So um, it's a really good question because we recognise that uh, residents in care homes, and of course care homes vary hugely. Uh, it could be, I think most people have a picture of, of very elderly, but we have uh, residential care for younger people. We need to think of all of those as well. Um, and uh, care homes for uh, people with dementia who may find it very difficult, for example, to follow social distancing rules. So relaxing small measures can be very difficult to to achieve. Uh, but I think at the moment the, uh, the guidance is its advisory, as we keep say saying, uh, it is for individuals to choose. But in a care home setting, uh, it is very important that the uh, level of uh, infection is kept very low because it is an accumulation, if you like, of a number of very, very vulnerable people often. And so I think where measures are there, I know uh, colleagues uh, in the Department of Health uh, are reviewing uh, what the visiting should be, but I think it's likely that the advice would be very much on a precautionary basis until we're absolutely sure uh, that outbreaks are, have ceased and that transmission is, is very much reduced. And I mean, there has been huge progress on that. Um, real thanks to very hard work from care workers and uh, residential care managers uh, who've been working really hard. But I, I think it's probably a little bit too early to be changing those. It's very important, both for, well, primarily for the residents, but I think also for our communities as well. We don't want to find that we're getting cases coming out of one place and moving into another. Great. Thank you. Uh, do you have a follow-up question, John? Yeah, I just wanted to ask you, um, Secretary of State, um, do you know when playgrounds in parks will be able to reopen so they can be used by children? Well, parks already are open. Uh, some parks were closed by local councils early in the pandemic, but we thought that was wrong. It's important that people, particularly families with children and those living in flats and cramped accommodation uh, in towns and cities can have you know, the open space to, to go to. So we asked all councils to reopen parks. And uh, I think other than uh, a very small number, all councils have, uh, have, have done that. So parks are open, playgrounds uh, are not open in most cases. Uh, because obviously there it's very hard to socially distance in a playground anyone who's got children knows uh, that that's pretty difficult to control but that's something that we will keep under review um, and uh, take advice from Jenny and her colleagues when we think it's an appropriate time to do that. So to, just to add to that, of course, one of the difficulties with playgrounds is it's not your small social circle, your household, or even a slightly wider one. In a public playground, children will be coming from a multiple different families all in one go. Uh, they'll be climbing up slides, wiping their nose, and you know, pushing it down the side of the slide. It's not a good place to be at the moment, so I think not in the immediate future. Great. Thank you very much, John. The next question is from Pippa Quira from the Daily Mail. Uh, Daily Mirror, sorry, I do apologise. Pippa. You're on mute, Thank I think, you. Pippa. This is, a question, this is a question for the Deputy CMO and you, Secretary of State. And we talk about quite modest changes coming in from tomorrow, but of course, millions of school children, primary school children, are going to start going back to school from tomorrow. How can you reassure parents and teachers that it's going to be safe, not just for the kids themselves, but for the wider community, especially when test and trace doesn't yet seem to be capable of controlling local outbreaks? Well, thank you, Pippin. A, a very important question for the millions of parents who will be um, looking to send their children back to school tomorrow, I hope. The first thing I think to say is that 80% of schools have been open throughout the whole of the pandemic for the children of key workers and for certain vulnerable children. And thousands of teachers have been going into their workplaces 
uh, to look after those children throughout. And we're very grateful for teachers for doing that. So we do believe it's possible to open schools safely, and we have the, uh, the, the track record, if you like, of that, as the schools have been open for many weeks now. We can also look to our uh, European neighbours and see uh, how they've managed to open schools successfully and the lessons uh, that have been learned from that. It's obviously extremely important that we do this in a safe way. That's why we're doing it uh, in modest steps, with only with certain uh, age groups at a time, trying to ensure that as a result of that, that class sizes are reduced, there are fewer children uh, in each classroom, um, and that the right advice is provided to all the teachers. And we've been engaging the Education Secretary uh, and the Department for Education very closely with teachers, head teachers, and with the trade unions. And we'll keep on doing that to try to ensure that everyone who works in schools feels as comfortable as possible. And it may be that there are some parents uh, out there today who uh, have not yet made the decision to send their children back to school, but will do so uh, in the days ahead when they've seen other people make that step and schools manage to reopen safely. Um, I certainly hope so, because it's extremely important that we do get children back to school. All of the evidence suggests that it is children from the most deprived, the poorer households, who are losing out by not having that crucial face-to-face -face contact that you get in a school setting. And I don't want to see that continue for any longer. Jenny. Thank you. Um, I, I, I could make some comments about uh, transmission and things in children, but I think they've probably been heard in the media. I think your focus of your question was on the, the track and, uh, and trace. Um, I mean, the formal service has actually only been up for, I think, since last Thursday, uh, but actually uh, public health teams right across the country routinely follow through in outbreaks and look at them. I think some of the differences here, some parents have been quite concerned about testing, so testing capacity is now very significant. It's up to 200,000 tests a day, so there's plenty of capacity. There are plenty of contact tracers, uh, and importantly, um, since uh, last week, the, the step for the younger children, the fives and the fives, uh, for testing is also in place. So I think uh, these are quite um, big changes, I think, in the capacity that's available uh, to look into outbreaks. Not only that, but of course, within every school, the Public Health England guidance highlights a hierarchy of interventions. Um, and some of the important ones for outbreak situations are the fact that children are in small groups and the advice is not always able to be followed, but wherever possible, that they stick in that constant group. So again, the risks of social uh, interactions are reduced both in the school uh, and in the follow through. Thank you. You, you can tell Pippa, or do you have a, a final yeah, question? A very, quick, a very quick one, if I may. Um, it's a broader lockdown question, really, actually, and it's for you, Mr Jenrick, that despite it being time, according to the Prime Minister, to move on from the Dominic Cummings affair, if people don't fully abide by the new rules which come in tomorrow, and we've seen examples over the last week or so of people pointing to that particular affair, um, as a reason for why they should, should perhaps not follow the rules as strictly as we'd all like them to, what are you going to do about it? Well, the, the government, it, it's incumbent on the government to move cautiously. It's incumbent on the public, all of us, to behave responsibly. And as Jenny said, to try to limit our interactions, to maintain the social distancing rules to the best of our ability. And it's incumbent upon the scientists and the medics who are advising the government to monitor the data as closely as possible and ensure that we politicians ha are armed with that uh, as we come to the next decision point. And if the rate of transmission does start to rise above one or dangerously close to it, then obviously we won't be able to proceed with some of the other easings that we would all wish to do so that we can get businesses back uh, to work, more children back to school and make our daily lives uh, more bearable. Uh, we're going to be doing this in a very cautious and data-driven way in the days and weeks ahead. Thanks, Pippa. And the last question is from Reverend Stephen Brooks, who is from Keep the Faith magazine. Stephen. Good afternoon, Secretary of State. Today happens to be the very special day we call Pentecost Sunday, the time when Christians would normally uh, be congregating to celebrate the birthday of the church some over 2,000 years ago. We acknowledge that social distancing has an important role in limiting further transmissions of uh, coronavirus. But for Christians, assembling ourselves in, is intrinsic to our faith. 
When will restrictions be eased and congregations allowed to assemble again? And will the government give churches uh, clear instructions and guidance to prevent any unnecessary breakout of COVID-19, similar to the guidance for education settings, which is very detailed? Because what we want to do is to make sure we do not have uh, a breakout that we saw in Frankfurt, Germany on the 10th of May, where the churches were allowed to reassemble and then there was a breakout in one congregation of 200 uh, people catching the COVID-19 virus. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I want to see uh, places of worship open as quickly as we can. I understand how important it is for millions of people in this country, and I can understand how people of faith would consider it strange that shops, cafes, pubs, restaurants, many other settings might be open in the weeks and months ahead, but not somewhere as important as a place of worship. We're working very closely with faith leaders. I've convened a task force uh, which has brought together the main faith leaders, um, and we're working to provide exactly the kind of guidance that you're describing. Some faiths have already actually produced detailed guidance, uh, working with Jenny's uh, colleagues at Public Health England, how one might cordon off part of a church or place of worship, how you would ensure it's sufficiently clean, you train the volunteers who run a church, how you might just enable a small number of people to go in at any one time. I think the first logical step is probably to open place of worship for individual or private prayer, and that's what we're working towards with the faith leaders. And then that will be a springboard, hopefully, conditional on the rate of infection, obviously, to small weddings, for example, again, very important to many people, um, and then in time to services. As you say, we certainly don't want to see what we've seen in some other countries where large gatherings in place of worship, particularly because of the demographic in some faiths, because of singing hymns and so on, which can lead to uh, sort of ex you know, exhalation, um, can create particular problems. But I I'm hopeful that the work that we're doing with faith leaders will bear fruit and that we'll be able to see place of worship open uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you very much indeed for your question. And that brings uh, this afternoon's press conference to a close. Can I thank uh, Dr. Jenny Harris and, in particular, Dame Louise Casey for joining us today. Thank you.